I'd like to first of all thank Nalanda Buddhist Society for inviting me for this uh, talk to uh, this morning. As uh, Sister Ailey has mentioned, this is a continuation of the forum that we had last month on staying positive during the pandemic. But today's topic is specifically on managing anxiety and worry. And while it is easy to say that uh, we want to stay positive during the pandemic, the reality is that very often we are not able to do that. Instead, our mind tune in or gravitate towards the negative thoughts. And when we have reached that point, it becomes, it can become very difficult to stay positive. In fact, it can become very difficult to even manage our anxiety and worry. And it, is, it can disrupt our life uh, exceedingly. So this morning, I will try to discuss on how best we can manage anxiety and worry that ensue. Okay. Now, as you know, anxiety and worry is one of the five hindrances. And they are called hindrances because they hinder our mind from staying calm and clear. And without a mind that is calm and clear, it is often very difficult to sort out any problems that we have. Right? Now, apart from uh, restlessness and worry, the other five hindrances are sense, desire, ill will, sloth and torpor, and skeptical doubt about the Dharma. But today we will focus on restlessness and worry or anxiety and worry. Uh, anxiety and worry, once we get to that point, it means that we are suffering. We are in a state of dukkha. Right. And it is not the dukkha, it is often not the dukkha that we get from physical pain, from birth, aging, illness and death. Rather, it is a dukkha that we get from our mental pain, from not getting what we want or from what we perceive to be getting what we don't want. Right? So it is a mental suffering, basically. But it can arise from worries about physical suffering as well. Right? Uh, if you have attended the forum last month, you would have remembered Brother Benny Liao talked about the Salatta Sutta, where he mentioned there are two kinds of pain, physical pain and mental pain. And he said that while it is almost inevitable that all of us will suffer physical pain, it is not necessary so for us to also suffer the mental pain. So we can say that pain may be very real and unavoidable, but suffering is optional. Right? Now it is easy to say that, but for most of us lay people, it is almost impossible to peel ourselves away from these two layers of pain because when one comes, the other automatically follows. What we really have, actually, what we would really like to have is to be able to deliberately pay our attention to positive thoughts and thereby experience desired outcome or good experiences. Unfortunately, our untrained mind, our mind within us already have very set mental habits. Mental habits that automatically place our attention to negative thoughts. And in that, we end up with undesirable outcome and experience. Right. So I want you to remember this word mental habit because we are going to introduce this concept and explain a little bit about mental habits as we go on. But first, let me just share with you these definitions of fear and hope. Someone once told me that hope is expecting what is desirable to happen. 
fear is expecting what is undesirable to happen. So basically, you can see that the two definitions are quite similar. The only difference is in what we focus on to happen. Right? If we focus on what is desirable, then we have a feeling of hope and motivation. On the other hand, if our mind focuses on what is undesirable to happen, then fear arises. And with that fear comes anxiety and worry. You will notice in this definition also that fear, anxieties and worries are the result of projecting our mind into the future, expecting something into the future. It is not a pain that we get by reflecting on past things or keeping our mind in the present moment. In fact, if you have gone through a lot of meditation retreats, you will have already heard from your meditation teachers that if your mind is focused in the present moment and accepting that present moment, there will be no fear, there will be no pain, there will only be peace in your mind. Right? The only time we suffer is when our mind is either too far back to the past or too far forward into the future. So, what causes anxieties and worries basically is the fact that our thoughts are focused on negative outcomes. Therefore, we get fear and they are manifested as anxiety and worry. Which means that our problem is our inability to focus on what we want, on what is desirable for us to experience. But not only that, we also have these other mental habits where once we focus on something negative, the mind proliferates, meaning it starts to expand on that negative thoughts. It adds a lot of drama into it. And the more it adds, the worse it becomes. So in the end, what we end up with is a mind that is totally full of gloom and doom anticipating the worst outcome possible. And that is why we suffer with fear, anxieties, and worries. In short, it is an undesirable mental habit that we have. One that, if we are able to change it, can drastically improve our quality of life mentally. If you look at Devda Vitaka Sutta, which is a sutta found in Mahima Nikaya number 19, the Buddha says, whatever one thinks about and ponders repeatedly becomes an inclination of the mind. What this means is that it is a mental habit. And mental habit comes about because we repeatedly think about something. So much so that eventually it becomes a habit that we do automatically. Now, mental habits are useful, but they are also mental habits that are unuseful or even harmful to us. So the first thing to do is we need to be able to uh, recognize our mental habits and differentiate whether they are harmful or not. If they are useful, we leave them alone. We only want to deal with those that are harmful or are un un uh, um, unhelpful to us. Okay, like I say, I want to talk a little bit about mental habits and how they are formed. Um, I, would, I often give this analogy or these examples of how uh, mental habits are formed. It's like someone going into a virgin jungle. When you first go into a virgin jungle, there is no path for you. When there is no path for you, you have to put in a lot of effort to clear the path. Chopping down the trees, chopping down the plants, the bushes, clearing the way. So the first person to go through the virgin jungle is often the one that has to put in the most effort. Subsequently, your second trip through the path will become easier because it's already cleared and there's only a little bit left. And the third person going through will be even easier. So over time, the path becomes very clear and you, do know, you no longer need any effort to, to use the path. In the same way, this thing happened within our mind. When our mind has 
uh, acquired a new habit. If you repeat something over and over again, what happens is that the, the mind, the nerves, start to create a new pathway. This is what science calls neuroplasticity. The, the, the neurons in our brain is elastic enough to create new pathways. The problem is that once the pathways is created, then it becomes fixed. So if your mental habit is a good hand, mental habit, then when it becomes fixed, it is actually very useful for you. That means you don't even have to think about it. It just comes automatically useful for you. The problem is if we have mental habits that are harmful to us. And today I'm going to share with you that we do have a lot of mental habits that are very, very harmful to us that we may not be aware of. And we will try to pinpoint some of this. Okay. So people say that old habits die hard. So if you have old habits, it is difficult to change, but it is not impossible. And there's no need to kill the habit. You simply have to replace it with a better one, which means you will have to now create, consciously create uh, a new kind of thinking. Now the scientist says that there is a habit loop and it starts with a trigger. The trigger can be external, like a person that you see or uh, events that happen, or it can be internal within our mind itself, a, a specific thoughts that we associate with certain things. And once the trigger happens, we have this automatic behavior that leads to an outcome that is rewarding. Now, the word rewarding here can be very misleading because if it is rewarding, then it should be a good outcome. But it is not so. It is rewarding in relation to something that is worse. Okay? There may be two negative outcomes. What happens is that we choose a behavior that gives us the one with lesser pain. Right? But that lesser pain may be just a temporary relief. We are not uh, actually uh, dealing with the actual problem. Okay? But I, I don't want to go deep into the habit loop, but what I want to point out here is that we must be able to recognize that there is a space or a gap between the moment when you get the trigger to when the uh, automatic behavior starts. Okay. Now this space, this awareness of this space is very important because this is where you can do something about it. This is where you can have a choice. But in order for you to, this, to see this space, require a mind that is calm and clear and focused. So you need a mindful state of mind. Huh? Your mind has to be very mindful about it. Now, in, in the automatic response that you get when, you, when something is triggered, you, there are three different ways that you respond. One is a fight meaning we go towards what we are fearful of, we face it. And in this way, there are also two approaches. One is confrontational, the other one is compassionate. Okay. Now, the, there are differences in whether what we are confronting it or we are looking at it compassionately. Confrontations also connote a certain level of hostility and resistance to what we are facing. Whereas compassion doesn't have that. Compassion means we accept what is and allow it. We just watch non-judgmentally, right? And that is the kind of response we want to train ourselves to have. The second type of response is a flat response. We run away from it. We try to avoid it. Our, our system has this ability to deny reality, okay? Look, look at Donald Trump in the United States denying the pandemic and see the disasters the, the whole country has to suffer for it. Okay? So denial can be a coping strategy, but it is very often not a very wise coping strategy. Okay? The third response is freeze, not able to respond at all. I'm sure some of us have uh, uh, experienced being asked to speak in public and going up and suddenly face the crowd and freeze. Okay, I don't know about you, but I have that experience before. So I know this is also a third response. But what we want to do 
in our mental habit is to train ourselves to face whatever is there compassionately uh, with acceptance. The other concept I want to share with you before we go into the strategies of how to deal with our emotions and thoughts is this concept of nutriment. This concept is also found in the sutta, but it is rarely mentioned or elaborated upon. But it is a very important concept. The Buddha says all beings subsist on nutriment. This is found in Anguttara Nikaya 10.27. What it means is that everything that exists needs food. So physical body needs physical food, right? If you want your body to be strong and healthy, you need to feed it with the appropriate and healthy food. Otherwise, if you starve the body, the body becomes weak. The mind is also the same. If you want to make the mind strong, you feed it. If you want to make the mind weak, you starve it. But there is a difference huh, with the mind as with the body. With the body, if you, if you feed the body with toxin or something harmful, the body dies. On the other hand, if you feed the mind with something toxic, a negative thought, the mind doesn't die. In fact, what it has is a stronger negative mental habit. Okay. So this concept is important because now we realize that in order for us to create new mental habits, we have to start the old ones that are not useful to us and feed the new one. This is how we strengthen our mind and create new mental habits that are useful to us. Because whatever we feed grows. And when we pay attention to our mental object, we are actually feeding it with energy. Right? So we feed it with energy, we validate it, we make it stronger. Therefore, it is very important for us to see what it is in our mind that we are feeding. I can give you another example, which is uh, two tigers in a cage. This is an old story. There was an old man and his grandson. And he, has, he kept two tigers in his, in his home, caged in the cage. Huh? One tiger is called love. The other tiger is called fear. Right? And these two tigers are constantly fighting each other. So the old man says they are constantly at loggerhead and fighting each other. And the young boy asks the grandfather, he says, Grandfather, which one will win? And the grandfather answered, the one I feed. You see, the one he feeds will be strong. The one he starts will be weak. This is the same thing we must do to the mental habits that we want. We must feed it. The mental habits that we don't want, we must stop it. That is a very important concept. Huh? So now we go a little bit into the thoughts. In Devda Vitaka Sutta, the same sutta that we mentioned just now in Majjhima Nikaya number 19, the Buddha actually says that there are two types of thinking, unwholesome and wholesome thinking. Wholesome thinking are motivated by non-sensuality, non-ill will, and non-harmfulness. And it leads to neither one's own affliction or the afflictions of others or both. It promotes lack of vexations, meaning no anxiety, no worries, no fear. It fosters discernment because the mind is calm and clear and therefore can see clearly. And it finally leads to unbinding Nirvana. On the other hand, the other group, the unwholesome type of thinking, it, they are motivated by sensuality, ill will, and harmfulness. And they lead to one's own affliction as well as the affliction of others and both as well. And they promote vexation, fear, anxiety, worries. And they obstruct our discernment, our ability to stay calm and clear and it does not lead to unbinding. Right. So, um, in the last uh, forum, 
I talk about irrational thoughts and uh, I, I was told that there are some of you who wanted to know a little bit more about irrational thoughts. Now there are two types of negative thoughts. There, there are actually more than two types of negative thoughts. But the two types of negative thoughts that I want to focus on today are basically the negative self-talk and the irrational thoughts. Okay. Negative self-talk, I think most people uh, can understand it easily because it's what we tell ourselves. Oh, I'm, I'm unworthy, I'm bad, I'm uh, incompetent, I'm a loser, I'm a failure, I don't deserve this and that. We often have this negative self-talk. And this negative self-talk is creating a lot of harm in us because it demotivates us and it takes away our self, a sense of self-worth and confidence. Okay, People with a lot of negative self-talk are very fearful and have no confidence. Okay. And the way to go around this is to be observant of the thoughts that you are talking, that you are telling yourself. This inner self thought needs to be made aware in your conscious awareness. And then you can do something about it. You can replace it. Right. But the other type of irrational thoughts are a lot of things like assumptions, biases, criticism, denial, drama, expectations, fallacies, generalizations, and judgmentals. I'm just going to uh, describe each one of them briefly, and then I will share with you an example and see whether you can uh, understand it from there. Assumption is when we jump to conclusion. Uh, we, sometimes when somebody says something, we quickly jump to conclusion and say, oh, he actually is talking about me or he means me, but in actual fact, the person may not be talking about you at all, all right? But we simply jump to conclusion because we think that every, when everybody talks about something, it's always about us. And some people have that kind of uh, thinking. And very often, we have this uh, drum, uh, habit to dramatize things. Small little things, we make a mountain out of a molehill. Uh, small little issues can be exaggerated and expanded and magnified. Okay, expectations are usually referring to the kind of uh, expectations that are over and above reality, uh, more than what uh, it should be. Fallacies here, we are talking about um, fallacies in thinking, logical thinking process is uh, faulty here. And generalizations is very common because um, generalizations is like this. If, uh, if one person um, is uh, unkind to you or is uh, bad to you uh, and that person happens to be from a different race, then you generalize and say, oh, that people from that race are all like that. You know, it's a generalized statement, whereas in fact, it's only one particular person, right? We have a lot of these generalizations in our mind and they can be very misleading and inaccurate. Judgmental means we judge people all the time. We criticize, criticize people all the time. Okay. These are not necessarily called irrational thoughts, but they are thinking styles that are not useful to us and can be quite harmful. Right? Okay. Now, in, uh, in, in psychology, they have very specific names. And, and there are many other more different types of irrational thoughts. One of them is called catastrophizing. That means you see only the worst possible outcome. Right? Minimization means you minimize your own good qualities. Uh, when you do something good and people praise you, you say, oh, yeah, no, no, this is a small thing. However, when you do something wrong, you see it as a big thing. So minimization and maximization, but in the wrong way. right? Grandiosity means there's an exaggerated sense of self-importance. Wow, I see myself very important. When I go into a, a certain place, uh, people don't come and greet me, I feel insulted. That kind of grandiose idea some people have. Huh? Personaliz personalization, like we say, everything is about me. Yeah, everything people say seems to indicate that it is about me. So some people have this. Magical thinking is believing in rituals that can uh, believing that rituals can protect them from things. A, a lot of uh, religious people are like that. 
they are very ritualistic and thinking that uh, that can uh, be uh, helpful to them. We have already mentioned jumping to conclusions and there are also some people who have this all or none thing, a very black or white thinking. That means if I'm good, I must be always good. If I'm bad, I must be always bad. If you have that kind of thinking and you make a mistake, you will consider yourself a total failure throughout your life because you, you think it's either this or that. Uh, while it can be quite uh, surprising for us, in reality, we do see quite a number of patients who think, who think like that. Huh? Delusional actually is uh, even, even more uh, severe or extreme kind of uh, thinking that are way out of reality. So what I'm trying to share with you here is that we do have a lot of irrational thoughts or thinking styles that are not useful to us. It is in our mental habits. And it is important for us to differentiate, to learn how to differentiate what is facts from what is not facts or fictions. Okay? And many of what is not factual actually are our own personal preferences and biases, our illogical thinking, meaning uh, our thinking processes is faulty in, in some ways. Right? We don't, I, I'm not going to go into great details about all this because actually the psychiatrists or the psychologists have a worksheet for you if you want to pinpoint all this. Right? This is, we, to do this, we have to go very deep in, but we won't be able to do that uh, today. What I want to do is to highlight to you that there is such a thing as irrational thoughts and that a lot of the time, our thinking are not based on facts. Okay, so for example, I'm just going to show you this picture, right? And I would like to ask you a, to, to give me a statement, put it in the chat. Give me a statement, a factual statement about this picture. Can you do that? Can you offer to give me a factual statement about this uh, picture? Uh, I'd like to take a look at the chat. Okay, there I see a lot here. Right. The flower is red. It is a pot of flower. Plastic. There is a white pot. This is a plant. This is a plant. There are six flowers. The flower is red, healthy plant, pot of plant, real and fake looks the same. Fake flower, fake plant, beautiful flower. The leaves are green, nice picture. It is a plant, happiness feeling. Okay, beautiful plant. Right, okay, good. So I would like to just quickly come back here. Right, from all these statements, um, I'm quite pleased to see that uh, most of you are quite aware of what is factual and what is not. But look at it this way. Is this a fake plant, a plastic or not? We cannot know for sure, although the picture looks like it is fake. In reality, it may be actually a real plant. Some real plants look, can look quite plastic. Okay, so when we make that statement, we are assuming that our assessment is correct. But again, it is an assumption because there is no way for us to validate whether it is true or not. Okay, so that is one thing. Sometimes we make assumption and we consider that to be true. And after that, we act on that assumption, thinking that it is true. Right. The other thing I noticed is that some people say, this is a beautiful flower. Right. Now, beautiful flower is an opinion. For you, it may be beautiful. For others, it may not be beautiful. Right. So when you use the word beautiful, it is an opinion and it is relative to, to some other people's judgment. 
What if I tell you this is an ugly flower? Are you going to fight, fight me? It is not. Because ugliness or beautiful is in the eyes of the beholder. So that is not factual, but it is an opinion. Sometimes we can't differentiate that and we think that our opinion are right and other people's opinion are wrong. Okay? So we don't give people the freedom to have their own opinion. This happens very often in religious groups where you have this fanatical belief that what I believe in is right, what other people believe in are wrong. And therefore, I will try to force my truth to, onto others. Okay. But by and last, I think you guys are very good, already uh, play it safe and uh, use very factual statement like the, the leaves are green, the flowers are blue, uh, red, the pot is white. These are all factual. This we can see, all right? But there are some who we need to be aware, some of these things like fake or plastic is an assumption and until we can verify it. And things like beautiful or ugly, or healthy or unhealthy, it looks healthy, but you may not be able to see that there could be some fungus infection at the back of the plant. Okay, so some things are assumptions, some things are our personal opinions. We need to be able to differentiate that. Okay. The other thing that we have in our mind that is problematic to us is this process called a pancha, proliferative thinking. It is also a mental habit and it's, like I said, it is an expansion of our negativities and we move on from one to the other. And the problem with this is that it actually obscure the bare data, the bare reality. Let me give you an example of my own experience. When I first started out as a, as a GP in, in my clinic, um, I saw this new patient of mine and uh, he said he was a salesman. And at the, at the, uh, he was a car salesman. At, the, at that time, I was also interested in buying a car. So he convinced me to buy the car through him. So I was convinced, I paid him the deposit and I gave him all the documents necessary to process and uh, get the car. But by the end of the day, when I went home, I start to wonder, this is a new patient, I've just met him. How can I be sure that he really is a car salesperson? And I've already uh, written a check to him and passed him all my documents. What if he is not? Right? So I start to worry about, oh, losing my money. And then it gets worse. What if he uses my document to obtain a loan under my name for the price of the car? Then it gets even worse. I start to think, what if he uses my document to, to, to get a bigger loan for a house or something under my name? So you can see how the mind starts to proliferate from one unverified fact to more and more unverified facts. So what I have here is a proliferation of thought where I have jumped to conclusions, making assumptions, uh, maximizing, uh, catastrophizing, looking at the worst situation possible. But in the end, actually, it turns out that he was genuine and there was actually no need to do anything, right? So I wasted my time worrying and couldn't sleep that night. So the solution actually for us is mindfulness. Mindfulness is a very important mental tool. And mindfulness is a very important mental tool that is long lasting. It is a tool that is useful for us over the span of our lifetime. It helps us if you want to transform ourselves and it is helpful to us if you want to develop yourself spiritually. Dr. Ong, can I interject a little while? Uh, on the screen, we still see the pot of flowers. Oh, yeah? Mm. Oh. Okay, let me stop this. Uh, let me stop the chat. Let me share again. Oh, 
Okay, okay. I, do you see it now? My yes, yes, now we all can. Right. Thank you. Okay, all right, good. All right, so uh, in order for us to change ourselves in any ways at all, the first thing we need to do is to be aware of what it is that we need to change. That's why they say awareness before change, ABC. So we need to be aware of our thoughts and feelings. And that is possible when we practice mindfulness. And it is important to point out that mindfulness is not a practice that you can gain instantaneous benefits. It takes a long, continuous practice in order for you to benefit from mindfulness. Okay? It's like meditation. If you practice a little, you gain a little. If you practice a lot, you gain a lot. If you practice completely, you gain completely. But mindfulness is an essential tool to allow you to master your mind. Right? Okay, so when is the best time to plant a tree? The answer is 20 years ago. And when is the second best time to plant a tree? The answer is now. Why 20 years ago? Because if you have planted a tree 20 years ago, you will be able to enjoy its shape right now. But if you haven't, now is a good time to plant. The same thing with our mindfulness practice and our meditation practice. When is the best time to practice? Probably 20 years ago. Then we would have benefited. But don't worry, if you haven't practiced, then the second best time is now. So we want to do that. Right. Now I want to just quickly go through this uh, practice of mindfulness because I think most of you are aware already. But I want to point out a few things on it. Mindfulness means bringing our attention inward, not outward to our body, feelings, or thoughts. And to be aware of the object that we are supposed to pay attention to. And to do this by allowing whatever that arises to be okay. We are not going to fight it, we are not going to resist it, we are just going to allow it to arise. So we look at it non-judgmentally. Okay? And then we try to investigate the experience. So what we are doing when we do that is we are changing mental habits because our old mental habits, our daily mental habit is always looking outward for problems and solutions. We think everything that happened to us is because of things outside of us. When in fact, the reality is that everything that happens to us in our experience is what is happening inside our mind. We also train our self uh, to focus Therefore, we train our scattered monkey mind that we have on a daily basis to a mind that learn to be more and more focused. And this ability to focus is very important. Like we said earlier, it is because of our inability to focus on what we want. That is why we have a lot of anxieties and worries. Okay. The third thing is we are changing our old habit of resisting the uncomfortable feeling that arise by allowing. So it's a new, different mental state. Changing from a, a state of resistance to a state of allowing. And also from a mind that is judgmental to a mind that is non-judgmental. Basically to a thinking mind, to one that is simply watching. Watching passively. Again, a good reminder is what the Buddha has said, whatever one thinks about and ponders repeatedly becomes the inclination of the mind. So with this mindfulness practice, we are changing a lot of old habits that are not serving us. Huh? The benefit of mindfulness is of course the ability to focus better so that you can place your attention wherever you want it instead of automatically running away to some negative thoughts. It brings calmness and clarity to the mind and concentration. Okay. So, some strategies to manage emotions. Now, like I said, mindfulness practice is a long-term strategy. It is useful for your personal transformation to transform your negative emotions as well as to have greater insight into your thoughts. But sometimes, or for a lot of us who may not have been practicing mindfulness for a while, or who have not practiced at all, we need some quick fix to our anxieties and worries. 
So for that, what we can do is uh, um, the importance of pausing each time we feel something negative. Okay, pausing is to find that space in between the trigger or the stimulus and your behavior. Okay, there's this practice called anchoring, which is a term borrowed from the NLP or Neuro Linguistic Programming. Anchoring is basically the process of associating physical sensation or physical gestures or, or action with a mental state, with a specific mental state. Okay. So for example, if you have been a meditator and you uh, are able to uh, sit down with a calm and peaceful mind, with a certain gesture, you create yourself a certain gesture. Each time your mind is calm, you create a gesture, any kind of gesture, hand gesture. That's why you know some, in some traditions, they have this mudra. This gesture, you associate it with that feeling of calmness and peace. And when you do this repeatedly over time, next time when you want that calmness to appear immediately, you only need to make that gesture. And the mind will start to be, uh, start to calm down. This is the same kind of uh, technique that the sport coaches use. You know, they get their boys to say, uh, yes, yes, yes. That gestures, although it seems very uh, uh, normal, is actually associated with a feeling of confidence. You know, ready to fight, ready to fight the other team. So this is called anchoring. Uh, for a lot of people, a simple way to anchor ourselves when we get negative emotion is simply to take a deep breath and slowly breathe out. Take a deep breath, slowly breathe out. Okay. When you do this a uh, few times, you start to gradually associate, it, associate this gesture with a sense of calmness or slowing down your thoughts and making your mind more aware and more alert, okay? Now, when you do that, um, once, you, you, once you have calmed yourself down, once you have uh, start to pause, then you can start to look at your feelings. Uh, you look at your feelings, learn to recognize your feelings. You don't have to, you can always start with a very vague description of your feelings, positive, negative, neutral. But over time, you will be able to recognize and be more specific with describing your feelings, whether it is anger, whether it is fear, whether it is anxiety, whether it is a sense of uh, doom or things like that. Okay? And the important thing is not just to recognize the feeling, but also to allow the feelings to come up without resisting. All right? In the beginning, allowing it to come up without resisting can be very counterintuitive because we are already used to this habit of always resisting what we don't like. But over time, with practice, it becomes easier to allow. All right? And allowing allow, uh, trains us to become more accepting to the, to the feelings. After that, then we can start to look at our thoughts and, and look at it from a non-judgmental point of view. Okay. Right? But these are all uh, meditation practices that I, I think some of you already know. What I want to uh, say is that um, Venerable Thich Nhat Hanh sort of give an example of how to practice mindfulness. And, and he used the analogy of a mother attending to a distressed baby. Say this mother is at the kitchen doing some cooking or whatever, and the baby is in the living room. Okay. Then suddenly the baby starts to cry out in distress. What does the mother do? The first thing he, she will do is to put down everything that she is doing at the kitchen and walk towards the distressed baby. And when she walks towards the distressed baby, what is the next thing that she will do? She will pick up the baby and pacify the baby. Okay. Only when the baby is pacified or uh, settled a bit, then she will try to see what is the cause of her distress. This is the same thing we do with our mind. Okay. 
when we when we get a distressful mind state, the first thing to do is to put down everything that we are doing and look inward, go towards the distress. Okay. And the first thing we do when we reach the distress is to pacify ourselves, embrace it, allow it, be kind to it, be compassionate to it, pacify it first, so that the negative feelings subside or reduce. You know? Only then should we start to investigate. Because if we are distressful in our emotion, it is hard to investigate anything because the emotional distress is too much. So the first thing to do is to overcome that distressful emotion. Okay. And uh, Venerable uh, Mingyo Rinpoche uh, has a different uh, analogy where he says that, imagine that you, you see a very rapid river and there's a boat in the river. Right? Now, if you are standing by the bank looking at the, the boat in the river, you will not feel that distress and therefore you can uh, observe and investigate what is going on. On the other hand, if you are in that boat, you are not going to be investigating, you are going to try to survive the, in the rapid river. So you will be too busy to, to be able to investigate. Right? So the, the same thing is, the, the, the lesson here is that we must first calm our emotion. Huh? Be mindful, uh, embracing it, be compassionate towards it. Then only we will. Once we have gone through that, then we can start to investigate. Okay. I want to say a few things about resistance here because when you have resistance to your emotion, it is an indication of fear. And if you continue to focus or if you continue to feed the resistance, you only validate the fear and make it stronger. So always acknowledge the resistance. The moment you acknowledge the resistance, it means you take responsibility for it. For it. But you also start to allow the resistance to be there. And that stops you from feeding and strengthening the fear. Okay. I, there's a good uh, poem that says, uh, that refers to resistance. It's called a guest house. Um, but I don't think I want to go through it with you. Right? It's quite long. Huh? But basically what it says is that whatever comes, you allow it. Whatever comes, you allow it. No need to fight it. Okay. So basically, they, there are many ways to relieve uncomfortable feelings. Okay. One way is through your mindfulness practice, uh, which we have mentioned just now. But there are also other simpler ways, temporary ways. They are not uh, so long lasting, but they are temporary distractions, like going out for an exercise, go for a walk in nature. Some people like to do shopping. Some people like to do uh, other relaxing activities. Chanting is also a good way to, to distract yourself from the distress. Uh, some people find journaling, writing about their thoughts and feelings on a piece of paper or in a book to be very, very effective. I personally like this very much because I've used it before and, and I think uh, you can learn a lot about yourself there. There are many other techniques that uh, we don't have time to talk about. Basically, what you want to do is to learn to befriend your negative feelings. Don't be afraid of it. Don't fight it. Recognize it, acknowledge it, and explore it. Tolerate it initially, allow it, and then finally be comfortable, totally comfortable with it. So sit with your emotions as they arise, feel them, listen to them, appreciate them, but never run from them because they'll track you down and haunt you until you are courageous enough to face them and ultimately learn the lessons that they hold. Okay. Now, I, I don't want to go too much into gaining insight because I think the, the main thing we want to, to talk about is managing the anxieties and the worry and therefore the negative emotions that come up. But very quickly, once you have gone past that, you can get a lot of insight by looking at your thoughts. Whether your thoughts are rational or irrational, and if they are irrational, what type of irrational thoughts they are. That is good for your own personal understanding, but it is not necessary. What is more important is for you to be able to see the link between your thoughts and how that affects your feelings. And that in turn affects how you behave and act. 
that link is very important because this is the link that the psychiatrists and psychologists use in their cognitive behavioral therapy, the CBT. To teach you why certain thoughts affect you emotionally in certain ways. Okay, so that is something that you want to see when you practice and investigate. And it's always a good thing to question your thoughts and challenge your thoughts. Because our thoughts are not what it seems to be. Eh? This uh, Dr. Russ Harris wrote a book called The Happiness Trap and he says, all too often we react to our thoughts as if they are the absolute truth or as if we must give them all our attention. In reality, not all thoughts are true. In fact, many of our thoughts are not true. And therefore, we actually do not need to give attention to them. But we disproportionately give our attention to them and therefore we energize them and we strengthen them and it becomes mental habits that are harmful to us. Not all thoughts are equal, so you don't have to give them equal weightage. Some thoughts you can just ignore, some thoughts you don't have to uh, deal with at all. Just drop them if you can. I don't want to go into these two tasks, which I have mentioned uh, in the q and A in, in the forum. But basically, I want to uh, point out that the Buddha has also talked about how to manage negative thoughts. And you can see this in this uh, Sutta in Madhima Nikaya number 20. I think uh, it is useful to read it and learn. So when your mind is agitated, the first thing to do is pause and acknowledge that you have an anxious mind. Allow the anxiety to be there, no need to fight it, no need to resist it. You can visualize yourself feeling calm, you can challenge your thoughts, or you can try to think it through or change your focus. Okay, these are the basic steps. Huh? One last word about thoughts, uh, about worries. Huh? Science, scientific studies have shown that 85% of what we worried about never actually happened. And the remaining 15% that did happen, out of that 15%, only about 3% can be considered as serious. The other 12%, which constitute 79% of the remaining 15%, are things that we can handle. They are not as serious as we think. So basically, 97% of what we worry about is nothing more than our fearful mind punishing us with a lot of exaggerations as and misperception. So, when we worry, we actually waste a lot of our time because 90% of the time, we don't have to worry. Okay. And lastly, again from Brother Benny Liao, a uh, quote from Chanti Dewa, if the problem can be solved, why worry? And if it cannot be solved, worrying will do you no good. Okay, so with that, I end my talk. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, I will be happy to answer. Uh, Thank you, uh, Dr. Ong. Sadu, sadu, sadu. Many of us would be able to relate to the irrational thoughts listed out as it has happened many times in our minds as well, um, but that we suffer from holding on to them. We are reminded that whatever we keep doing will become a habit, including our thoughts. And we need to be mindful so that we can strengthen mental habits which are useful and replace those which are harmful. Dr. Ong, we have a few questions already in our chat. Let me uh, read them out for you. Uh, the first is from Brother Yao Singh. Dr. Ong, how do we let go of our subjectivity to achieve mental ease and feasibility? Sorry, um, I, can you repeat the question? Uh, let me repeat that. Yeah, how do we let go uh, of our subjectivity to achieve mental ease uh, and feasible? Um, and feasible. I think maybe. I don't quite understand the questions. Can can the person who questioned it please uh, rephrase it or explain what, what he or she wants? Okay, uh, so maybe Brother Yao Singh, uh, um, you can uh, rephrase it and put it in the chat group. Um, there is a second question from Sister Megan. Uh, she would like to ask about why do people who are severely stressed or depressed 
hurt themselves. It's inflicting physical pain, a way for them to release their mental pain. Yes, this is often uh, sadly very true. Between physical pain and mental pain, many people feel that many people actually uh, prefer physical pain to mental pain. That's why they physically inflict themselves because physically inflicting their own pain takes them away from focusing on the mental pain. Okay, that is why you have people who are depressed, who are, are so uh, emotionally painful that they are willing to uh, cut their hands or uh, hurt themselves physically because it is a way, uh, it, it's a distraction from the mental pain. And it is a harmful way of coping with stress. I, I hope that answered the question. Uh, yes, it's a, it's a mental way of coping with stress. Yeah. yeah. Um, Okay, uh, Brother Yao Singh uh, says that it's okay, but maybe I can relate to his question, um, which is we have our own personal biases, our personal likes and dislikes, and it causes us a lot of uh, mental stress because when we look at something, we react to it based on our personal bias. So how can we get rid of that? Okay, all uh, right. Uh, um in any kind of uh, distress, uh, the source of the distress is always a thought. Okay, so when you feel distress, if you are mindful, if you are able to look at, go backward and see what was the thought that gave rise to the, the emotional distress, then you will at least be able to understand the cause of your distress. Then the job is to basically replace our negative thoughts. That is the first uh, advice from the Buddha in the Vitaka Santara Sutta, replacing a negative thought with a positive thought. And uh, what, that happen, what that means is that we must first be able to recognize that we have negative thoughts. Right? And Yes, you are right. We have a lot of beliefs and a lot of our beliefs are actually uh, negative or harmful to us. So the, our job is to be able to recognize those beliefs. Uh, there are also a lot of beliefs and thoughts within us that we are not aware of because they work subconsciously just below our conscious awareness. So our first job is to try to bring that up to our conscious awareness where we can recognize them once we can recognize them, then only we can replace them. Okay. So again, that, 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 for that to work, you need a lot of mindfulness. You need a lot of self-awareness uh, to be able to look at yourself uh, in your thoughts, which is why journaling sometimes is very useful. When you sit down and reflect on your feelings, it can, you can actually trace it back to your thoughts. And then you start to recognize, hey, yeah, why do I think like that now? You start to question their thoughts, questions their belief. Once you start to question that belief, that, that the solid belief start to crumble, start to break up. And it becomes easier for you to start a new belief. So you stop feeding that old belief and you start to uh, feed a new belief. Okay. This, this is easier to describe, but it's actually very hard to do. Huh? That is why a lot of people with uh, this kind of limiting belief, harmful belief, and irrational thoughts, they, they, they go through these things with their psychologists or their uh, psychiatrists, and, and they do this on a weekly basis, you know, to, to pinpoint it. And you have to do a lot of homework. You have to go home and you have to fill up your worksheet on uh, what, are, what was the thing, what was the emotions that you had, uh, and uh, what was the thoughts that you uh, could identify and then they, they go through it one at a time. And it's a never-ending uh, work 
but it is very useful and life-changing. It is a, a transformative uh, process. And, and for a lot of us, if we are mindful enough, we can do it on our own. We don't need to go to a psychiatrist or a psychologist if we are able to be more self-aware of our own feelings and thoughts. So the key here is the self-awareness of our feelings and thoughts. Once you are able to be aware, then you can do something about it. Thank you, Dr. Ong. A lot of uh, reflection mm -hmm. as well from what I hear. Um, Sister Annie Chua has a question. Sister Annie? Oh. Yes, yes. Hello, uh, Dr. Ong. Uh -huh. Thank you much Hi. for the talk. Um, I want to ask you a question about planning. When we are planning to do something which we perceive as very important, for me, I think a lot and uh, sometimes overthink in anticipation of what may go wrong or what may not. So is that also like a kind of mental proliferation? Is there any mental proliferation that may actually be useful or necessary? Because sometimes it's really quite hard. Yeah. Thank okay, I, I think I understand what you mean. Because sometimes when we plan a project or something, we have to look for possible obstacles, possible problems that we can may encounter and we want to be ready for them. Okay, I think when we use the word proliferative thinking, we are referring to the kind of thinking that are out, completely out of proportion. Okay, but to be able to be a, a, a step forward to be ready for potential problems that are realistically possible that it can happen. I don't think that would be considered as proliferative thinking. I think that is proper planning. Uh, uh, they are, the, the difference is that they are actually quite useful. Right? If your thinking starts to go out of proportion and think of even other things that are unlikely to happen, maybe one or two percent likelihood, then it and it starts to be, be distressing to you, then it can be considered as proliferative thinking. But if you put everything like this down on paper and, uh, and once you, it's done, you put it aside, you, you are no longer disturbed by it, I, I won't consider that as proliferative thinking. All right. Thank you, Dr. Ong. Uh, we have a question from Sister Levin. Um, she thanks you for the sharing. How do we deal with our judgmental mind towards a person who sees on a daily, who we see on a daily basis, and we only and we always know what he or she will uh, do, and our judgment is always right. I think it's always judging someone who we know very well. How do we break that judgmental mind? Yeah, I think this happens a lot in the family itself uh, and people we are close to because we spend a lot of time with them. So we sort of feel that we should know the person very well. And sometimes we feel that we know the person better than they do about themselves. Right? Uh, yeah, that, that can be um, a frustration to us when we see that, hey, you know, I see the problem with you. How come you can't see the problem with yourself? And each time we try to point it out to them, they just deny it and just, or they just can't see it, right? Now, the, my, my own rule for myself is like this. I try to point it out in a very non-judgmental way. I don't want to personalize the, the, the problem, okay? So, I will try to, to point it out without a sense of accusation, which means you have to be very careful to choose your words wisely. So this is where right speech comes in very useful. You have to be very reflective first before you say anything. And even after you have done that and they still can't take it or they can't uh, uh, accept it or they continue to deny it, I think the next step is if you have done this repeatedly and you see no change, the next step is for us to have to accept that this person is like that. And we will try to uh, not so, um, make ourselves not so irritated by their, by their 
behavior. You know, in other words, we need to look at ourselves and see our own reaction to them. And because we cannot control what the other person choose to do or want to do, we can, on the other hand, control how we react to this person. So we look into ourselves and see our own reaction. Is it helpful? Is it healthy? If it is helpful or if it is unhelpful and unhealthy, we should learn to let go as well. So this is also a lesson for us to be able to let go from our side. You know what I'm saying? Uh, I, I, I understand, I think I understand uh, what you're trying to say because uh, I have similar experience like this before as well where, you know, I try to point out uh, certain things about that, that person and no amount of pointing out can change that person. So the next thing I can do is to change my own reaction, mm. right? So I think that way is something we can control. That is something within our means to control. And uh, we want to change that reaction to something more uh, beneficial and healthy. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Ong. Okay. The, the problem also is changing ourselves, so it takes time. Uh, because yeah, yes. we all already have the habit of thinking that this person is like that and he will irritate me. Then automatic, the negative emotion will come out. Correct. Correct. It's very true. The moment you see that person already it comes up before you can control it. So we need to really train ourselves to be very, very mindful of our reaction. This is where our Dharma practice comes in. Yes. You know, this, in fact, that's why the, the Tibetan says, these people are our gurus. You know, they, they keep reminding us of the things that, the work that we still need to do for ourselves. Yes. yes. Thank you, Dr. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Ong. We have a question from Sister Sandra. How do we kick out a bad habit such as watching TV? <laughs> uh, one of the methods mentioned in the Vitaka Sankara Suttas is to reflect on the negative consequences of our habit, of our negative uh, habits. So if you are watching TV too much, uh, that is one way you can do to reflect on uh, what you can achieve if you don't watch TV that much. Uh, what are the positive things that you could do with that, the time that you, you have allocated to watching TV. So reflecting on the negative outcome of the negative habit is one way. Change, changing it or replacing it with something else that is more beneficial, beneficial is another way, which means you, you take a look at why you want to watch TV. Actually, a lot of us watch TV as an escape from our daily stress. Yeah. But if that is, if escaping from our daily stress is the goal, then look for other ways that you can do to also escape from daily stress that are more healthy for you. Like some people prefer to jog in the park, uh, go for a nature walk. Uh, you know, these, these are more healthy for you physically as well as mentally. Uh, so that can be used as a replacement for watching TV. But if you are saying, oh, well, now we are in this uh, pandemic, uh, we don't want to be out there too often then maybe an uh, indoor exercise um, or even simple things like rearranging or cleaning your house, your bedrooms, your living room or having a hobby that you like, like uh, you know, planting some flowers, some, some plants, uh, healthier habits to replace uh, that one. And, and and see if that also brings some kind of relief from your daily grind. Thank you, Dr. Ong. Um, and we have, uh, I think we will go with another two questions. Um, so Dr. Ong, earlier it was mentioned that continuous questioning and challenging our thoughts was encouraged. May I know whether this will be harmful to our self-confidence and lead to skepticism? 
Uh, that, that depends on uh, the kind of state of mind that you are in when you question your, your, your thoughts. Huh? When we say questions our thought, we are actually referring to a point where you are already at the level where you have already overcome the distressful emotions. Okay? You remember we talked about uh, first looking at our emotions, uh, allowing it, don't resist it. Um, embrace it, compassionate towards it, then when the emotion, the, the distress, the emotional distress has settled, then only we look at our thoughts and we try to challenge it and question it. But that actually comes at the very end of your mindfulness practice. The earlier part of your investigation of your thoughts should be to simply watch and recognize what are the thoughts that you have. Okay. If you watch and recognize the kind of thoughts that you have, you will see that you have a lot of very good thoughts, but you also see that you have a lot of very negative thoughts. And you will see that there are a lot of beliefs, and some of these beliefs are serving you well, some of these beliefs are not serving you well. In fact, some of these beliefs are downright harmful to you. Okay, And this is what we meant by challenging the thoughts, the beliefs. You, you start to recognize the beliefs that are not doing, uh, not serving you, that are harmful to you, and you challenge that, okay? Um, okay, of course, there's another level where you look at uh, the thoughts itself and challenge the reality of your thinking. But I don't think we should go to that level unless you have a lot of spiritual maturity, right? Uh, because once you reach that level, you're, you're talking about existential questions, okay? And that is a lot deeper. Uh, that kind of questioning and challenging is a lot, lot deeper. And you should do that only when you have already settled all the other more day-to-day -day kind of uh, irrational thoughts. Okay, So don't jump straight into too much into existential questions like that because then you start to challenge your, own, your very own purpose or existence in life. If you have not had that kind of stability yet of your mental state, uh, going straight into that kind of existential questions can be uh, have a very negative outcome. So I wouldn't encourage uh, people to jump straight into that first. In fact, the, the thing to do is, I, I know the, the goal of our Buddhist practice is actually to go through the self and come up the other side of the self to see that there is actually uh, no solid self. But in order to do that, you don't jump from, from this end, one end to the next straight away. You actually have to go through a process where you have to, in fact, strengthen the self first, stabilize the self first, before you can start to, quest, to go through that and ask existential questions, right? Otherwise, you will have issues. So uh, don't, don't be too hasty in uh, that kind of questioning. Thank you, Dr. Ong. Uh, the last question. Some children, they do not have concerns on their duties. For example, they do not show concern on their homework, but they spend a lot of time gaming. May I know, is it healthy to put some stress to these children to push them to change their behavior? For example, make them more anxious uh, if they fail in schooling. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I... I know the present, present way of thinking is never to stress our children. But I grew up the old school where my parents actually stressed me right, uh, to achieve. So I think the, the real solution is a balance. You cannot totally don't give stress to your children. Okay? Why? Because we need a little bit of stress to motivate ourselves. And not only that, we need to be able to learn to cope with stress. Because our life will be stressful. Their life in the future will be stressful. We need, therefore, to learn to cope with stress. So to totally shelter them and protect them from stress is not the solution. In fact, to me, it's very harmful. In the end, they grow up, they don't know how to cope with stress, even small stress. So a little bit of stress, given 
at a level where they can tolerate it is the best kind of stress. Okay, so to me, you have to strike a balance. 